Oh, that's not a good sound. Hey, so I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I have a few guitars. Now, the reason that I have all these guitars is not that I'm super, super rich from all the YouTube money. No. The reason I have these guitars is because, well, I make guitars. My neighbor knows that I do this because he walks by and he sees me sanding and working on the guitars all the time. So that's where this video comes in, because he gave me a gift. What do you think, guys? So let's be honest, this guitar is in kind of rough shape. You know, they say everything tells a story. I would really love to know this guitar's story. Like, uh, wh what's happening? You're playing one day and then just, oops, where'd the guitar go? Uh, so there's a few things in here. Ah, here's the bridge. We're gonna need this. I'll just put that there. Um, this is one of the braces for the top. Uh, these used to be structurally integral to the guitar and now they're uh, sort of uh, decorative. Now, believe it or not, this guitar is worth saving and that's what we're gonna do. Why is it worth saving? This is a Gibson classical guitar. Now I know Gibson are not known for their classical guitars, but still they make fine quality instruments. And this is a really awesome piece from the 1960s and it just got dropped into my lap, kind of literally. So, we're gonna try to save it. Although the label was dirty and hard to read, I was able to read just enough to determine that this was a rich pick signature model classical guitar. And this was one expensive guitar. Back in the 50s, this would have cost the equivalent of $4,000. Remember a moment ago when I said this was from the 60s? Turns out I was wrong. Based on the serial number, I believe this guitar was produced by the Gibson Company in 1958. Speaking of the serial number, it's low. How low? 200. I had a hard time believing that because it's such a neat round number. But after checking the label and the back of the headstock, they both confirmed that this was indeed the 200th guitar to come off the line. And that's great news because when it comes to tone wood, the older the better. As wood ages, it becomes harder and more resonant, improving the tone. That means that your guitar sounds the worst it will ever sound today. So if your guitar playing sounds bad to you, don't worry, at least the guitar will sound better tomorrow. The first order of business was to sand away what was left at the original top. I used a sanding block to keep everything as level as possible. The notched wood you see around the perimeter of the body is called kerfing. It helps maintain the shape of the sides and gives the top and back something to adhere to. The next order of business was to replace the missing braces on the inside of the body. A word about bracing. String instruments have to be made of very thin wood in order to resonate. Without bracing, that thin wood would buckle and break under the pressure of the strings. To make new braces, I cut strips from Sitka spruce. For the best tone quality, the braces need to be tapered toward the edges. This really should be done with a chisel, but none of my chisels were in good shape, so I used the belt sander instead. Having shaped the braces, I apply glue and place them in the body. Any excess glue can be wiped up quickly with a towel. When clamping, it's really important to get even pressure in order to form a good joint. I use pieces of scrap wood as calls to spread the pressure evenly across the workpiece. With the braces in, things are starting to take shape. I chose to order a pre-made spruce top. After locating the center of the guitar, I placed the top where I wanted it, clamped it in place, and drilled two holes. These holes will serve as locating points. One of the holes I drilled was a bit askew because of the clamp, so I removed the clamp and drilled it again. I'll use two nails as locating pins to help me find this exact position later. All of these holes will be covered when we install the fretboard. I used a pencil to mark where the top meets the body. So now it's just a matter of getting close to that line. The bandsaw makes quick work of any excess, and the belt sander helps me get close to the final dimensions. It's a little jagged right now, but it's starting to look like a guitar again. I need to trim away some material from the top in order to make room for the neck joint, which protrudes slightly. Now that our top is close to the right dimensions, it's time to attach the braces. Without these braces, the top is actually very flimsy and easily broken, so I'm eager to get them on. This brace is actually one of the few original parts that I found inside the body of the guitar. By looking at the notches in the kerfing, I was able to work out where at least some of the braces would have been. That allowed me to mostly follow the original design. I used the same process as before to mark and cut the new braces for the top. Again, lots of clamping. After getting more of the story from my neighbor, I learned that this guitar originally belonged to a professional musician. The guitar met a tragic end, however, when a later owner tried to convert it to a steel string guitar. The tension of the steel strings is significantly greater than that of the nylon strings, and not having the proper bracing to handle that sort of force 
it literally tore the guitar apart. These smaller braces are very important because it gives structure to the area underneath the bridge. The bridge is where all the tension from the strings is exerted on the top, so it needs to be strong. You can see now why stringing a guitar like this with steel strings is such a terrible idea. After the new braces were installed, I applied the glue and used the locating pins from before to help me find the correct position for the top. The glue I used is high glue, which is made from animal products. It's arguably not as strong as modern wood glue, but is used on string instruments because it can be broken along the glue lines without tearing the wood around it. This is important because if an instrument needs to be repaired, the glue will have to be broken and you want the glue to break without destroying the instrument. I had intended to use my homemade spool clamps to clamp the edges of the top, but I found that they didn't hold as well as I thought they would. Fortunately, I had a number of conventional clamps to go to instead. I guess I was in there a little while because Sophie came in to see what I was doing. After a great deal of clamping, the top was secured. You may have noticed that gluing and clamping is a recurring theme in woodworking. Look at all the clamps I have. Still, it seems like I could always use just a few more. After gluing the top, I used the Dremel tool to trim a lot of the excess material off. This is one of those things that would be easier if I were building the guitar from scratch rather than repairing it. The purpose of the channel you see here is to provide a recessed area where the plastic binding is installed. Because the channel has already been cut, the only way to make the top flush with that is to very carefully sand down to that existing edge. After a lot of careful sanding, the binding is ready to be installed. The purpose of the binding is to prevent the guitar from suffering damage if it's lightly knocked against one of its edges. In that way, it's very similar to what a phone case does. At first, I tried taping the binding in place and then untaping it in sections to apply the glue. That didn't work all that well, so I decided to glue it up a little at a time for the back. After the glue was dry, I scraped the binding down flush to the top. I purchased a fretboard from a seller on eBay who was kind enough to cut the fret slots and plane it to the correct thickness. He even scored a center line for me on the bottom. Using that line, I drilled two small holes and used two indexing pins to keep the fretboard aligned while I trimmed it to size. When I laid the fretboard on the neck, I noticed a small but serious problem. The top I installed must have been slightly thicker than the original top. Because of that, the neck was actually slightly lower, creating an upward slope on the fretboard. Before installing the neck, I would have to make everything level. To solve this problem, I glued two layers of rosewood veneer to the neck. That made up for the difference in thickness and allowed my fretboard to sit flat. I used the Dremel tool to take off most of the excess material and then I scraped it down flush with a card scraper. I ended up covering the holes for my indexing pins, but no matter, they were easily excavated with a chisel. After double checking the fit of the fretboard, it was time to glue it in place. You can see what I mean again about clamps. You can never have too many of them. After the glue dried, I scraped the fretboard flush with the neck. To install the frets, I first made sure the neck was well supported, then scraped each slot with a razor blade to remove any debris then tapped each fret in place with a brass-tipped dead blow hammer. After installing the frets, the ends need to be filed. We begin by filing the frets flush. A great way to do this is with a file attached to a block of wood at a 90 degree angle. After the frets are flush, I switch to a block with a file at a 45 degree angle to round over the edges of the frets before hitting them all with sandpaper. With the frets now installed, I wanted to locate the position of the bridge. 
The bridge position is critically important because if it's even slightly off, the instrument will not play in tune. To help me, I clamped two tuning machines to the headstock. I would have simply installed the actual tuners, but they had not arrived yet. At the other end, I clamped a temporary tailpiece to hold the strings. This will allow me to stretch those strings across the bridge and double check their tuning and alignment. I'm also using a specialty tool from Stumac called the Saddlematic. By marking off the distance from the nut to the 12th fret, it shows us the correct placement for the saddle. After setting up this elaborate jig, I realized that the original nut for the guitar was hopelessly low and it would need to be replaced before I could proceed. To remove the nut, I used a razor blade and a small hammer. It takes some patience, but with care the nut came free without tearing out any of the wood. The best material for a nut is bone. Taking my bone to the bandsaw, I cut a piece roughly the right size. I would be remiss if I didn't point out the smell is horrible. I was glad when this part was over. After cutting and sanding the nut to the right dimensions, it was time to cut the slots for the strings. I used the old nut as a guide to get the string spacing right. With the new nut installed, I was finally able to attach my two strings and align the bridge. One thing that's interesting to note is that the best bridge position is derived through compromise. As I plucked the strings, I checked with my tuner and shifted the bridge. It was clear that the best intonation we could achieve was a slightly sharp high E string and a slightly flat low E string. Now I hear you saying, why didn't I just get it spot on for both? Well, therein lies the flaw in fretted instruments. Due to the physically different nature of the strings, no instrument with straight frets can ever be perfectly in tune at every point. Thicker strings tend to fret sharp compared to thinner strings. To account for that, we actually have to angle the saddle slightly, but it still doesn't totally eliminate the problem. Because of this, bridge placement is a compromise. Having said all that, when the bridge is located correctly, any differences in intonation are almost imperceptible. After determining the best bridge location and string alignment, I penciled and taped around the outline. The tape turned out to be incredibly helpful in getting the bridge back into the right position for gluing. To apply pressure evenly across the bridge, I built a call with two screws in the middle. That allowed me to clamp down each end of the call and then tighten the screws to apply pressure in the middle. I left the bridge to dry overnight. I waited until this point to finish my fret work with the strings in place. When frets are installed, they're seldom level. To level frets, you first need to mark them with a sharpie and then sand with a block that matches the radius of the fretboard. In this case, the fretboard is flat, so we use a flat block. When all the lines have been sanded away, we're close. Next, I use a tool called a fret rocker to look for any frets that are still slightly high. Any frets that sit higher than the others are likely to cause string buzz, so we need to locate and level them. When I find a fret that isn't level, I mark it and then shave material off with a file, checking my work with the fret rocker throughout. When the straight edge of the fret rocker no longer wobbles, the frets are level. After leveling the frets, we need to recrown them. If we left the top of the frets flat, it wouldn't play in tune. To round over the top of the frets, I use a special tool called a fret crowning file. It's a concave file that shaves material from the outer edges of the fret while leaving material in the center untouched, thus creating the crown. With that, it's time to finish the guitar. After masking the fretboard and top, I applied a vinyl sealer to both the rosewood and mahogany surfaces. Because rosewood and mahogany are porous woods, I rub a clear grain filler called Aquacoat into the wood and scrape off the excess. After a few applications of the Aquacoat, the wood grain was leveled to a smooth surface. You might be wondering why I'm not filling the grain on the top. The reason for that is that the grain of the spruce is much tighter and doesn't require filling. After sanding the entire surface with 220 grit, I finished the entire guitar with clear nitrocellulose lacquer. When you're finishing a guitar, it seems like every bug in the neighborhood knows about it and wants to come ruin your finish. I evicted this one just in time. Here you can see the spruce taking on a beautiful golden hue as the lacquer begins to build up. And after about five or six coats, the guitar is finally done.